I'm Mark Pedowitz, Chairman and CEO of the CW Network. And I'm Rick Haskins, President of Streaming CW Network. You are listening to Think About This with Shelley Palmer and Ross Martin. The more you listen, the less you know. I'm Shelley Palmer. I'm Ross Martin. And you're listening to Think About This. Today, we're exploring the future of television. Shelley's interviewing Mark Pedowitz, CEO and Chairman of the CW Network, and also its President of Streaming, Rick Haskins. Plus, how can you be a work from home badass? Badass. And badass. badass. And, and <laughs> are jetpacks the best way to commute? So, welcome to Think About This. The more you listen, the less you know. Honey, I'm home. Okay, Shelly, so Google has now asked all of its North American employees to work from home. I just got an email from our own head of HR at my company with advice on how to be more productive at home. It Interesting. Was, it, it didn't nearly meet the standard of your <laughs> advice for working from home. But I, I've been working at home, you know, for like 20 years. So. Here's here's what our company is recommending to uh-huh. our employees. Daily check-in meetings with individuals or with the team. Uh-huh. Meetings via video conference. Yeah. And end-of-day updates with the team. I would have added, I'm not the head of HR for us, but I would have considered adding uh, free lunch for everybody. We're sending it out. It'll all be delivered. Yeah. That would be kind of fun. Mm-hmm. And then maybe like happy hour at like 5 p.m. <laughs> we just deliver booze to everybody's apartment. It's always five o'clock somewhere, Ross. Why I wait? Just, <laughs> yeah. I just feel like that would bring us closer together. Yeah. And also the thing about alcohol is I get that everyone's using the hand sanitizers and stuff and we're running out of it. But you also have to, you have to sanitize the inside of your body. <laughs> is that the way that works? And the alcohol will... Help you do that. Brown whiskey. My dear friend, Kern Shearson, informed me the other day that there's a run. Everybody in, on the Upper West Side is already working from home. Right. Because they have really nice homes. Right. And they're, they're all, they all went to the store and everybody went and bought all the sundries. Mm-hmm. And, and one of the things people went for first is toilet paper. Do you know why there's no more toilet paper left in the stores on the Upper West Side? You're going to tell me. Because there's so many assholes on the Upper West Side. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, my God. Anyway, A dad Shelley. joke. Well done. So, Shelly, you're working from home. <laughs> We've been remote working at the Palmer Group forever, mostly for two reasons. One, that everybody travels all the time, so we're always at a client somewhere. Now, the airplane travel has been a little bit curtailed, but... Um, working remotely is not in any way alien to my company and because it's just the thing you do when you're a consultant. But dude, you literally speak like three times a week. Yeah. Right. Like you, you are, not you right have, now. Like, <laughs> we have like 50 <laughs> keynotes that are getting canceled. Yeah. It's a, it's a giant number. The one who pays the biggest price for this is your wife, Debbie. <laughs> That's true. Because it's like you're home. Yeah. And she hates that. Wendy, I'm home. <laughs> It just messes her whole thing up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So what's your guidance for people who So it's important. You know what? This? That's a really interesting segue because the the first thing you need to do to work productively from home is to create a workspace. And I know that sounds obvious, like crazy obvious, but you need a desk or an area. It could be a shelf, it could be anything, it could be the cupboard under the stairs like Harry Potter lived in. You need a place that's yours, that is the workspace. And if you don't have that, then there's no way that you can come and go from work, right? You'll never be late for work, but you can never leave. You have to have a space that's dedicated. And for me, it's a small uh, spare bedroom that we have. Uh, and it's just set up like a real live office. And it's just always been there that way. I, you have to also keep office hours when you work from home. And that sounds crazy. But you get up in the morning and you do your morning routine, you go to work. Now, for me, that commute is down the hall. But wherever it is, even if it's just across the room, you, That's have, smart. you have to have regular office hours. And importantly, in regular office hours, you know, A, you take breaks that are scheduled. If you have a boss, your boss tells you when you can take a break, uh, whether it's a coffee break or, or a mental health break. And then you must take lunch exactly the same way you would mm. if you worked in the office and there's absolutely no way around this. You have to have a quitting time. Shelly, I think you're just missing one thing. Yeah, yeah. What's that? A quickie with Mrs. Palmer. Oh, stop it. <laughs> <laughs> Which brings me to my next point. 
The reason you have a workspace is so that when random humans, including Mrs. Palmer, walk in and say, hi, you can look them, stare at them with those laser beam eyes and go, hey, I'm working here. I will talk to you during my scheduled break or red lunch light, hour. Red light. Yeah. You, no, because what happens is when you're working from home, if you don't have a, a space that's set up specifically and you haven't declared your office hours and haven't made everybody clear that you are working, then what happens is they think you're home. And that's not an acceptable way to do work because if everyone thinks you're home, hey, guys, I get it. You know, you want me to change a light bulb or the refrigerator needs this or no. There's working from home and there's being home and they're different things. And so all humor aside, the declared office hours and the declared workspace actually allow you to be productive when you're working in your house. Great points. Now, you also need like a lot of tech. And most people have some tech in the house. You might be a Wi-Fi user. A lot of people are Wi-Fi users. You'll be surprised to learn, unless you're really close to the router or you and you must have a, a, a current router, unless you're really close to it, the Wi-Fi you're getting, and even if you are, the Wi-Fi signal you're getting is not going to be anywhere near as strong as just plugging an Ethernet connector into your computer. Oh, that's interesting. The good old-fashioned way, those wired internet. However, it's possible that you only have consumer-grade service. Possible. That's probable. Yeah, it is probable. So if you can afford it or if your company will pay for it, you call your provider and say, you'd really like something over 300 megabits per second. And to be fair, they now offer gigabit service. Gigabit service will give you the best possible video conferencing. And it'll that's industrial grade for almost any purpose. I would highly suggest, especially if your company will compensate you, to go ask for gigabit. Okay. All right. What are the other tools? So you really have to have uh, after you have a really good broadband connection, you have to have enough computer power to do the work you have to do. And a lot of people, like, you can't do real remote work on, like, an iPad. You can take that to the restaurant. You can walk around with that and have some communication. But if it gets serious, you actually need an actual – you need a computer. Some people are getting away with Chromebooks I and because they're all Google – Depending on what your office uses, depending on what your IT department uses, you should probably have a real live computer in the house. And what does that mean? Something with enough RAM and a fast enough video card to do the video conferencing we're talking about. If you don't know what that means, the nice people at like whatever your favorite computer store is or your IT director will tell you, I'm not going to like shills for stuff right now. The faster the video card, the better the video card, the more RAM you have, the more you're going to think your computer is powerful and the more powerful it will actually be for what we're talking about. It's not the CPU. You don't actually need to have like the greatest i9 Intel computer right now. What you need is a fast video card and you need a lot of RAM. Now, moving on. You should be scheduling your conference calls on a conference call system. If you're a work from home person and the company already has conference bridges, you're golden. But if it's your first time working from home and you're kind of a solo practitioner, you have to get into the practice of conference calls. And so you must schedule your conference calls as if they were meetings. And many of the conference call services will record the calls for you. You should either pay for and or let them record the calls. Oh, that's smart. And then transcribe it. it or they could do that. at least you can buy the transcriptions. But importantly, when you're really busy doing all this stuff yourself, you get to go back and go and listen to it and go, right. okay, this is the after action right. note I have to right. create as opposed to taking notes while you're on the call so you can be present on the call. And of course, the reason I use conference bridges is that I always have someone on the phone taking notes. And that's a good practice for when you're working remotely, have somebody whose job is to just take notes yep. so that you don't have to, especially if you're driving in a car or whatever that, I mean, in my world, you know, I'm in a car somewhere, I'm in a hotel room somewhere, I don't have all of my tools with me. So that's why I have people on the phone. But if you can't have someone on the phone, record. Also, super important, you must have a virtual private network, a VPN for security between you and your company. Now, if you're working for a big company, they will already have supplied this for you. But if you don't, you can use like encrypt.me or NordVPN or ExpressVPN or CyberGhost, any one of those. There's a lot of VPNs. You want to be on a virtual private network so that you are pretty much bulletproof. If you don't know what that technology means or if you feel scared about that, ask your IT director. If you don't have an IT director, just go to encrypt.me and buy the thing. It's 100 bucks. The one thing about working at home, though, and, and and is that this I think the sociology of working from home is harder than the technology, to tell you the truth. What do you mean? Well, so like you have to act like you're in the office. Yeah. If you're really yeah. not in the office. Yeah. So how do you bump into someone in the hallway? 
Like, what does that mean when you're not there and there's no hallway? That's a good point. And how do you like schedule a meeting that you wouldn't have scheduled because it wasn't part of a workflow? Right. Or reach out to somebody who you probably should talk to on a regular basis and you would if they called you into their office right. once or twice a week or once a month. So you need to schedule that when you work from it's home. It's true. It's really weird. Like, you know, you walk by someone or you see them in the bathroom or in the kitchen and you're like, oh, hey, I meant to tell you about blah, blah, blah. But if you call somebody from home, it's a totally different, awkward, engineered thing. And you're like, well, I don't really know why I was calling you. I just haven't seen you today. Exactly. Exactly. And so you need to develop either a check-in schedule or a tickler file. And the way that I do it with my both direct reports and the people I report to, which are my ver- various clients, um, I set up little ticklers in my task manager that just, you know, it's three days from now, seven days from now, on a regular schedule, nine to every, every 14 days I should be checking in with so-and-so or every month I should be checking in with so-and-so. It's so weird because you're like being really super intentional about the cadence of social interactions that were before left to happenstance and were, were more organic. Can right. I ask you Can I ask you a question sure. about working from home? Mm-hmm. Do you have to wear pants? Tonight on Where Are My Pants? Honey, where are my pants? <laughs> <laughs> like, do you actually dress, do you actually dress up because I just wear my pajamas. I wear the shit I actually want to wear, which is only one step down from the shit I actually wear in the office. <laughs> but do you, because I've committed to athleisure, by the way, as you know. You but have. Do you, and, you, and, and you wear it well. I, thank I you. Say. you. Thank are, you. you. And are, people are noticing. No, you're like the athleisure model of the year. So I'm a major proponent of uh, outdoor voices, which mm-hmm. I wish I had invested in. I, yes. So you, do, you, do you dress up for work at home or do you like just wear your Shelly Palmer bathrobe? Okay. Truth? Yeah. Truth is, it's gym shorts. <laughs> okay. It's my it's my Lululemon fashion yeah. show every day. So athleisure, but are you business courtesy of Debbie J Palmer, by the way, who who I, I, keeps the wardrobe stocked. Yeah, but like she look, gets bored with what I'm wearing because I I wear what's on top in the drawer. You're on television. <laughs> that is. You're on television basically every day. Yeah, and you're in video conferences all the time. Yeah. Do you, are you business up top and then gym shorts on bottom? Oh my God, you're all my secrets. Yes, yeah, it's a, it's yeah. it's the button down top and the gym shorts yeah, Lululemon yeah. bottom. That's what yeah, I thought. Of course. Think, don't yeah. think about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely don't think about that. Some free advice. You hoard toilet paper. You understand me? Hoard it. Hoard it like it's made of gold. Because it is. Thanks, Chuck. Oh, you'll thank me all right. Mark my words. I'll see you around. Yeah. All right. So, Shelly, we just got done talking about how you're supposed to pretend to be working when you're at home. Mm -hmm. Or as you said, actually working. Well, you can work from home. As opposed to remotely working. Right. Um, But here's the thing that we're both seeing is that the traffic on our podcast is going way up. We're through the roof right now. Like people are binge watching older episodes and then I'm getting texts and DMs from people quoting us. Now, theoretically, Ross, they're binge listening because they're, right, we don't have listening. any visuals. Right, which is our <laughs> fault. But So they are binge listening, which is kind of awesome. Thank yeah. you to people that are stuck at home, bored, and have literally nothing else to do. Oh. God. And Ross, what, you're so interesting. Nobody's bored. They're listening to you with great interest uh-huh. because the pearls of wisdom that come out of your mouth mm-hmm. are, are they're legendary now. So one of the greatest beneficiaries of this new stay-at-home life that has been thrust upon us would be television networks yes. and content producers, mm-hmm. especially those, those who make good shows, like, for example, The CW. Yeah. And they make incredible shows. Like, I don't even watch that much TV anymore. But if you watch the CW, well, they have the whole DC comic universe. It's on. sick. Yeah. Like my favorite is is Batwoman. Like, <laughs> it is because I, I think that Rose is, an, is like the perfect casting for that Ruby Rose. Oh yeah. And I think I think like the, the look and the feel of that show, the aesthetic of it, it's just it's stunning. It feels like you're watching a movie, but it's a TV show. So anyway, I think they're killing it. And I know you had a chance to talk to both Mark Pedowitz and Rick Haskins. So when we get back. From this commercial break, we're going to jump right into that interview. Shelly, have you noticed that I seem fresher, more awake and alive lately? And you have that amazing sort of glow. I'm I'm glowing look to you. Yeah, you want to know why? Okay, tell me why. Because I use purple. Really? Yeah, not the color, 
The mattress. The mattress. And here's the thing. Uh-huh. I, I genuinely have a hard time falling asleep at night because I can just hear your voice too loud in my head. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to fall asleep. Ross, and then, and then we I have subjects we must talk about. Yeah, and then I wake up <laughs> sweaty and full of anxiety Sorry. because we have to do another podcast episode the next day. Uh-huh. But I now have a purple mattress. It's the best mattress I've ever had in my life. You do look very well rested. I will say that. A purple material feels unique because it's both firm and soft. At the same time, just like you, Shelly. Hmm. So it keeps everything supported while still feeling really comfortable. Plus, it's breathable, so it sleeps cool like you. I am cool. Thank you for saying that. Shelly, you're going to love Purple. And right now, all of our listeners are going to get a free Purple pillow when they purchase one of these mattresses. Is the pillow actually purple? It is. Okay. And that's in addition to all the free gifts that they're offering site-wide. Go to their website. And what you should do right now is text THINK. T H I N K two eight four eight eight eight. That's think T H I N K to eight four eight eight eight. So Ross, what if I don't like this thing? Well, there is this one hundred night free risk trial, and to be honest with you, I'm on night ninety six, and I am not returning it. If you are not satisfied, you can return it for a full refund, but I'm not going to have to do that. It's backed by a ten year warranty free shipping and returns, and then free in-home setup and old mattress removal. Okay, so it's basically risk-free. Yeah, like what more could you ask them to do? The only way to get that free pillow is to text THINK to 84888. That's THINK, T-H-I-N-K, to 84888. Right now, message and data rates may apply. And now, Mark Petowitz and Rick Haskins from the CW Network. Hi, Mark. Hi, Rick. <laughs> How you guys doing? Good. Good. So we are going to talk, let's see, what are we going to talk about today? Today we're going to talk about the CW Network, the future of television, and what's really happened in the last nine months, which is the TV business everybody thinks they knew is gone, and now everybody's in some kind of crazy direct-to-consumer world, and as are you, but you guys have led the pack because of CWC and the CW app, so welcome and tell me about it. We actually were uh, one of the very first people to start looking at TV in a very different way. The reason why we did is we always let the consumer drive what we do. We want to give the consumer what they want, where they want it, and how they want it. And what we were finding is more and more people didn't necessarily want to watch TV the traditional way. Sure. And what they were doing is starting to discover it uh, first with YouTube videos, uh, watching things on digital. And so what we did is we decided to be one of the first national TV networks to get into the digital streaming business. And we did that about nine years ago and have been- That's what it was really hard to do. It was really hard to do. A lot of people didn't know what we were doing. And in fact, I remember people used to say that you can't have anyone watch more than a minute long video on- your computer screen because they just won't do it. Oh, do you remember the the size lot was like if you have a big screen, you're gonna have a half. Oh, yes. a movie you can have an hour and a half, then a TV you can have an hour. Was, that's exactly it was, right. It was, it was all nonsense. It was you nonsense. That, and then you 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 get on your laptop, you can have like three minutes, and on your phone you want like thirty seconds. Everybody had that sort of right, and then that's it. Snackable content. That is correct. Snackable. I remember that well. And then what we did is uh, our snack happened to be an hour long. Yeah. <laughs> and we found out that it actually worked and that the consumers were watching it more and more and more via streaming as opposed to traditional yeah. TV and, with traditional time. And then we designed the model, uh, which they did about a year before I got there. Then we all put it on steroids um, in terms of having our sales team sell uh, the CW premium content as, as part of the bundle between linear television and digital. Right. And did that, I mean, that obviously worked for the advertisers in a pretty good way. It was, it was fantastic. It allowed them to go back and forth and it's, and it's been enormously successful. And they got the one thing that most people don't get, which is they got premium content. Right. And they, and they it was in a safe so, environment. So what, really, Mark, everybody talks about premium content. What, and I think I know what that means. It's sort of like I'll know it when I see it. But there's so much content now that is in the eyes of the beholder. I mean, TikTok is premium content to some people, right? So when we say premium content, what do we what do we really mean? Is it it's some- really 22 minutes to a half hour to an hour long of film video content in a scripted form? Does that mean reality can't be there or, or, the, or known as alternative? As you can see by Netflix, they're making a big foray into that. But it's not biteable, snackable pieces. Right, right, right. Now, the question will be, can quality snackable pieces actually become 
another format for premium content. The that's jury's what, out on that. Qu- Quibi says so, right? The jury's out on that. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how that's going to work, but that's, I, I, I understand that's what they're trying to do. Again, what you do learn, uh, and we've seen in the past, that there's different behavioral issues in terms of on the mobile thing, particularly with the younger audience. They, they will tend to look at influencers to determine how to best do my hair, how to best do this, or how to do to, to, in TikTok. Sure, of course. There are now TikTok high school classes to, yeah. to, to do videos, yep. which is very different than a form of scripted premium content. Sure. Well, look, we've grown up with beginnings, middles, and endings, rising action, climax, falling action, stories that are uh, of a certain length, and they carry different arcs, but ultimately it begins, it has a middle, it has an ending. What I found fascinating is at Netflix, they're able to not do the grammar of broadcast television, right? They can keep these really long story arcs with the exposition happens in the first episode. Maybe they refer to it, but they don't have to reintroduce at all. And they don't have to do rejoiners. And it's like a really different kind of, you know, just the whole vibe is different. It's a 13 hour movie as opposed to chapters but in a TV show. But that is why show. when uh, the original Netflix and Hulu deals were made on behalf of the CW, that the CW's content was well received because it was bingeable. Because of the broadcast model told you you had to have a cliffhanger at the ending of each episode. Mm-hmm. And where there was no economic model for those types of serialized programming in the old traditional world in syndication, it became, I would guess, the killer app for a lot of the SVOD models. And it became a killer app for us Wow. On so expand on that for a little bit because I've had this conversation with a lot of creatives. So – you think that the chaptering and the cliffhangering actually added to the bingeability? Absolutely. I think that because you kind of know where you can stop and if you want to stop or not and where you can keep going to continue the story. The other thing that I think is really interesting is what is called long form doesn't really matter where you watch it. Over 50% of our viewing on Riverdale and All American, which are two of our younger shows, are done on mobile. So the tiniest screen, we're getting the largest audiences. And to me, that says it's all about convenience to the consumer and where they're watching, how they want to watch, and where they want to watch. So if you see these two different behaviors, and TV, big screen television in the living room is clearly an older medium. Mm -hmm. It just skews older. And the behaviors are that different. And I've heard this from other broadcasters that the digital behaviors are really, really different. It's pure convenience and yes. there's really no way to call it anything else. How does that all play when I'm an advertiser and I come to you and I say, look, I've got an awareness problem. I want to drive velocity at retail and I need to get a lot of people to know my thing. And the way I used to do that is I used to just buy some spots. And if I bought enough spots, especially on a Thursday night, then Friday when everybody got paid, they went to the supermarket and they remembered my thing. How does this work now? To an well, you have to look at it a longer horizon. You're looking at it at a seven-day horizon. You have to look at the fact that the linear play is connected to the digital play. And that's that, that digital play, in some instances, will be greater than your linear play. So it becomes a very different world. And for some advertisers, that works really well. But if you're having a President's Day sale and you're a retailer, it may not work as well for you. Yeah. That call to action at a at a time that's like four days away, yeah, the old you know, advertising right. Wednesday, Thursday for the Columbus Day sale for the mo- Sunday, Monday, Correct. that's harder in that in that time frame, that's right? Correct. But if you look at a long a longer frame. Brand love or or awareness, general awareness or Right. Yeah. And the other thing you do is uh you flight your advertising differently. In other words, you say, I want this flighted on Thursday and Friday, and then depending on the shows that are you're streaming. Um, you may get everything on the Thursday because a lot of people are going to watch it Thursday more than you expected. And the number of impressions you've asked for are going to be fulfilled. So you've got to look at it in a very different way when it comes to actually at buying the advertising. So what happens in a world where the digital people really don't care for advertising that much? How do you guys play in that world? Because you are Pretty much all AVOD, right? There's no S- well, we're uh, completely AVOD. AVOD for we're, you who are listening is advertising video supported or video on demand, advertising we, supported video we on demand. We felt as the CW and its brand that we would never have enough premium content girth to fully compete in a subscription model. So we decided what are we strong at? We're strong at selling advertising. Right. So we then learned how to bundle it, talk about it, go to the advertiser. Safe, safe environment. Here are shows. You know what audience we're hitting. 
because we've made iconic shows. They may not reflect on linear, but they're certainly going to reflect on digital. Do you want in? And the safety part is critical now because the viewability and, and, and obviously the content adjacency is not necessarily offered by every digital venue necessarily. Correct. I'm just going to say it that That way. is correct. And that, that is a very important part of our business. And obviously what we want to do is we want to protect the advertiser. We want to make sure that it is a safe environment that they can trust. And so we do have a broadcast standards practices that does that for us to make sure that the environment that they are buying is going to be an environment that is safe for them and their advertisers. And for advertisers, they know that we will deliver a younger audience. Yeah. They know it. They see it in our programming. So whatever happens on the linear maturation mm -hmm. of everybody does not necessarily reflect on the maturation of our digital median age. So it, it becomes a – that's the beauty. We're still a broadcaster. We're offering everything to everybody, mm -hmm. but it's not on a one live plus same day basis. Right. So let's talk about that. I don't, think, I don't think most people understand the modern windowing and the modern stacking of television because this business has changed so much. Everybody, you know, you're used to, you turn on the TV and you knew that if you saw a movie sometime later, it would be on television. You didn't exactly know where, but you knew it would be on TV somewhere. So I'll wait for cable. I'll wait for whatever. And so you knew there was windowing or maybe you maybe see an airplane. And But now, like, this is completely different. It would be awesome if you guys could take us through, like, how, well, you get a show. How does it get stacked? How does it get windowed? Like, when am I likely to see it? Like, how does that all work? Well, let's look at it two ways because now the CW is in a transitional mode with the ending of the most recent Netflix deal, which was a rolling five type stack, which means the last five episodes that were broadcast were up on digital. Got it. And you could only roll them, you know, as one came off, one came on, and vice versa. But what ended up happening was when we went to out of season, it went to Netflix, and Netflix would have the full SVOD stack, and Netflix would push it out in a very different way. So you would have done it AVOD, and they would do it SVOD. But they and would they, have the full and they have the whole stack, full stack, the entire set of episodes, whatever right. they are. At the is, end of the season, that, right? That holds true for all the shows we produce up until the 1920 season. So the new transition that we're in is Batwoman, Nancy Drew, Katie Keene, a show that come on this summer, Stargirl, we will be able to stack as an advod basis. Now that now requires a whole different mindset because we've been operating in one mindset for almost nine years. And how do you bring your viewer remember, we're not Netflix, we're not Amazon, right. we're CW, TV.com or CW TV app. So how do you now bring that viewer that would have migrated to Netflix to watch the show? And maybe then Rick would have the whole hassle of migrating them back for the exclusivity to come back. Now you control that stack through that whole summer where you saw a lot of binging going on. Riverdale, All American, In the Dark, Legacy, Supernatural, All Flash, all those shows got heavily binged. Now you have to self-create it. And I'll let Rick take some of that. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting. I think for however long we've been in the TV <clears throat> business, we were in the entertainment business. We're no longer just in the entertainment business. We're in the consumer product business because what we need to do is what we need to go out and talk to the consumer who is the viewer on a daily basis to remind them to come watch the full stack of our shows on CW. So it's a very <laughs> different mindset than people in this business have ever had to have. And, and, the, and the challenge for us, this is we'll only have of our 18 shows this season. Only four will go under that guise. By next year at this time, eight of the 17, 18 shows. By f two years hence, more than two-thirds of the schedule will be like that. So it takes time and it'll take a lot of effort from his So three team. to five years from now, you guys are in the direct-to-consumer business pretty correct. much full on. That is full correct. On. Exactly That's right. Pretty much full, full, full on. Yeah. And with no Netflix support. That's correct. correct. We have to – we live or die – by the quality of the shows and your ability quality to Quality of shows and the quality of advertising. And the quality of the marketing. And, and can you make, continually make, and you never know when it happens, iconic shows. And All American has now become an iconic show, like Riverdale was an iconic show. And that took a lot of effort from the marketing. I want to switch gears for a second. The TV business is not the TV business anymore. Right. It is now the direct-to-consumer business. Right. 
there are so many guys in this. There's so many players. You've got your uh, parent company, Warner Brothers, about to put out their thing. Disney's got their thing. Everybody's got their thing. Uh, every, we literally. have many parent companies. Yes, you do. <laughs> uh, and CBS has their thing. They do. They, you know, CBS All Access and Viacom's got a bunch of apps. But, and every, they just announced another D2C thing. So there's D2C everywhere. It's really heating up. In the old days, a year ago, Basically, your competition was the the remote control and and move your thumb left or right, up and down, and you know that was the competition. Now, that could have been a thousand channels, truly, but it really isn't because everybody watches ten, fifteen channels, and so your competition was the ten, fifteen channels they like to watch when you're not, you know, and you're not one of them. That's not true at all anymore. This is a hundred percent convenience. You've got a million people putting content out. What is the strategy going forward? Like, is it what are you guys just thinking about? I'm going to say something. We could respond. We have built our platforms, and I say our platforms, which includes linear, social, and digital, to be complementary to any service out there. Complementary. We're complementary to SVOD. We're complementary to other AdVod services. We don't look at that as a competition. We look at it. We offer a unique proposition. Here's our programs. Do you want in? Do you want out? I'll let you... Yeah, to me, I think the most important thing that we do is we understand every individual show's personality and who their audience is. And I got to tell you, every single show has a different audience. Sure. They have a different personality. The way that we do our social media posts, um, sometimes it's in the morning, sometimes it's in the afternoon, sometimes it's night, depending on what the cadence of the audience wants. And I think that's our most important thing that we do is understand the audience and give them what they want. And that becomes more and more important when you get more and more competition out there and more and more shows. The one that understands the audience for that show is the one that's going to win. Also, we've been very careful. We have a brand, thanks to Rick and his team and everybody else in corporate communications, we have a brand. We have learned through CWTV and CWC how to acquire property that fits into the brand. Most other AdVod services are giant grocery stores in the sense that they have everything under the sun. We don't. We're a very small, boutique-ish place. Obviously, very focused. You've got the DC Universe. You've got some really, really focused shows on uh, teen demographics and young mm -hmm. demographics. Does that change going forward? Or are you guys going to be like, I, what if I had to put a, Label, I'm a programmer, I'm coming to you. What am I bringing you? I will, will tell you, our challenge really is, is how do you maintain the brand but expand it in a way that does not disenfranchise anybody? Yeah. And I, I will say, I can talk about the CWC brand and what we're really doing is we started looking at movies and what 13 to 24-year-olds were going to. And the one thing that we found very consistent was horror movies. They tend to love those. They like to be scared. And so last season, we did a little horror pop-up and from that, we did a show called Two Sentence Horror Story, which really resonated. Yep. Uh, we're running it again this year. Uh, we put it on Netflix, and it really resonated there, too. So it's taking chances like that, looking in the marketplace, what our target audience is looking at, what seems to be reacting, and then moving it in in a CW way into our brand. Yeah, and we utilize Seed as an incubator beyond the acquisition of other programming, library product, and, and stuff. We look at it as an incubator either for technology or for programming ideas. And one of the other things we've learned through buying library acquisitions for a CW seed is, oh my God, this genre has a second life in it. Yeah. So is it that show? Should we develop something differently for the mothership? So you learn things and we are focused. And one of the things that we are quite lucky with is that we're small enough and flexible enough to make changes much faster than big ships. Yeah, yeah. So where do people find this content if they want it? If I want to find my CW content, where am I going? Well, here's the good news. You can find it for free on the CW app or CW Seed app. You can find it on your computer. You can find it on your tab. And just go to CWTV.com or CWSeed.com. You can see it free. You don't have to log in unauthenticated. And if you have something as old as a television set, What's that? there will be a CW network affiliate somewhere near your television. That is correct. <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> and, and But one of the things that Rick and his team have done remarkably well with CWTV is that they're linked together. When you go on to the CW page, you will see a category that says CW Seed. You go on to CW Seed, you'll see a category that says CW TV, and it feeds back and forth to each other. So I'm I'm in the brand, and I'm I've got 
access to all the content regardless of the app. That's going to work for me. Yes. Fantastic. Well, Rick Haskins, who's now the president of digital and streaming at CW. Yes. Congrats. Mark Pedowitz, now the CEO. And chairman. And chairman of CW Network. Thank you so very, very much for being here. You're my Thanks, Shelly. Shelly. So, Ross, Rick and Mark, unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah, spectacular. Who do you like better? Which one? I like them both very uh-huh. much. But here's a fun fact. <laughs> yeah. Both of them got promoted while they were on stage with us at CES at the Innovation Series Summit. I just think you talk about business impact. It was our fault. <laughs> you literally got – you did it. Yes. You literally got both Mark and Rick promoted on stage. I don't know what they – Thought was going to happen, but because of you, they have better jobs <laughs> and a yeah. shit ton more money. Yeah, that's true. I think they're making more money. Yeah, think about that. I mean, did you see them pull in with the, with the car they were driving? I did, actually. Pretty, mm-hmm. pretty impressive. Yeah, way to go. Because of this podcast and because of the people who are listening to what we're trying to build here, People have now started to send both of us. They've always sent it to you. Yeah. But now I'm also getting emails and DMs and text messages with stuff we should cover. Yeah. So people are sending me cool and weird and strange things that make you think differently about the world we live in. The one that I got from, I think, seven or eight people in the last 24 hours is that Dubai jetpack guy. <laughs> yeah. Have you seen this guy? I have, yeah. It's almost like he's like Batman flying through the skies. Yeah. Yeah, that is. How is it possible? Is that real? It is real. Um, This guy got to 6,000 feet. If you think about that for a minute, um, you could skydive at 10,000. At 6,000, you'd be sad if your engines were not working or lift wasn't happening. Right. He got up to uh, roughly 150 miles an hour, which is fantastic. And he was at altitude for under a minute, about 30 seconds he was up there. But here's the thing. Isaac Newton is driving this thing this guy was right. on. This is force equals mass times acceleration. Whatever he was feeling, he let's, it's as if you were on the most badass roller coaster ever. So I'm impressed that he did it. And the rig is amazing. If you haven't seen it on the internet, it's like, like a set of wings. Basically, he, he he's the fuselage of a jet plane. He has wings and an engine. That's right. And but he didn't – two things. One – he didn't look like he was in pain. No. He looked happy. I think he just looked happy that he was There are guys that hang glide and dig all that stuff too. Like you can show the guys that the jump out thing, of airplanes with the suits and the, they fly. The other thing that I thought was cool good. about it is he didn't just go straight up. No. Like he had all this control. Yeah. And he was able to move left, right, up, down. Yeah. And control and then hover. Yeah. And then just decide, okay, I'm going up now. And he went whoosh. It was very impressive. I'm I'm not necessarily sure that human drones are the future. <laughs> How long before a commercially viable jetpack becomes available? That that question has been asked so many times. You know, I, I think it's not going to be that long. I'll tell you why. At CES this year, there were no less than twenty companies showing us exoskeletons. Right. Yeah, I saw. Right. So people could lift things that yep. they would not be able to lift. There was this one where you had. Um, you could be about a, a five foot nothing human being and lift a two hundred twenty five pound payload. Totally, you know. I saw it. These were these yeah. superhuman suits where you could get in and actually pretend you are a superhero. Exactly. Yeah. So I think because of the robotics that were the advances in robotics, the advances in sensor technology, the way that uh, you can have edge computing and even a little bit of the five G stuff where you can get up to the cloud really quickly with low yeah. latency and and make adjustments. I think when you put all those technologies together, we can't be that far away from a commercial version of it. The the question really isn't, can you make the device? The question is, what's the practice of of getting people in the air? You know, when you look at those drones um, that were also at CES, the vehicles that they'd use either for rescue vehicles or right. single person helicopters that would, you know, drones that take you to the airport or whatever. When you think about the Jetsons or you think about Fifth Element, right, where, you know, Bruce Willis is going all around and all these cars are flying. You have to look back at the turn of the century when the first motor cars we're on the road, and there weren't things like traffic signals. Well, right now, there's still no infrastructure for air traffic control for human jetpacks or for drones. I think, basically, George and Jane Jetsons should be consulted because for <laughs> some reason, they never crashed. And like, everywhere they were going, it was perfect. I know, it was all figured out, and somehow we unfigured it out. Think about that. And there you have it. Don't forget to leave us a five-star rating at Apple Podcasts, a quick comment or review, and thank you for downloading and subscribing to Think About This with Shelley Palmer and Ross Martin. If you think you know less than you did before, just wait until our next episode on the Westwood One 
Podcast Network.